Hi, hello there. Welcome to Introduction to Operating Systems. On this video lecture, we will be talking about what operating systems do, computer system organization, computer system architecture, the operating system operations, resource management, security and protection, virtualization, distributed systems, kernel data structures, computing environments, and the free or libre and open source operating systems. At the end of this video lecture, you should be able to describe the general organization of a computer system and the role of interrupts. Second, describe the components in a modern multiprocessor computer system. Third, illustrate the transition from user mode to kernel mode. Next would be discuss how operating systems are used in various computing environments and provide examples of free and open source operating systems. Let's get started. Let's start with the definition of an operating system. So what is an operating system? So I have here different versions or different um, operating systems vendors like Windows from Microsoft, you've got Linux, all right? So Red Hat, Mac OS, FreeBSD, Solaris, and so on. So we have a lot of operating systems. So what is the role of an operating systems in a computer system? So basically an operating system is defined as a program that acts as the intermediary between the user of a computer and the computer hardware. So basically the operating system is the translator okay, between the device or the hardware and the user. Okay, So these are the operating system goals. So execute programs and make solving user problems easier. Second, make the computer systems convenient to use. Third, use the computer hardware in an efficient manner. Now imagine your computer without an operating systems. How can you run? How can you execute? And how can you play okay, applications on your computer? Okay, so how can you navigate onto the computer systems? And how would you manage the, the resources in the computer systems? So basically, that's what an operating system is. If we are going to look at the technical side of it, operating system is the one who manages the resources of a computer. Okay, so we will go into a deep discussion of those roles. Next would be computer system structure. So basically your computer systems is divided into four components. So you've got hardware, you've got operating system, application programs, and users. Now for the hardware, hardware is any tangible components in a computer system. So it provides basic computing resources. Now in operating system, you will often heard the word resources. Resources is anything that can be shared to other applications, to other programs on your system. It includes the CPU time, the memory, the IO devices, all of those can be shared. Next would be the operating system. So operating system controls and coordinates use of hardware among various applications and users. So as what I'm saying earlier, the operating system is the one who manages the resources. If we are going to have an analogy with the traffic, okay, with the car traffic, on the road so the operating system is a traffic controller or traffic enforcer okay so next would be application programs it defines the ways in which the system resources are used to solve the computer problems of the users so word processors compilers web browsers database systems video games all of those are application programs and these application programs it's a lot of resources. Okay, for instance, games. Games are often consuming a lot of memory 
resources. So the operating system is the one who is responsible for the allocation of those resources to these application programs. Okay, so if the application program needs to run, it defines or it asks for the amount of memory from the operating systems. Okay, and the last one would be the users. Users pertains to people or the end user, people where, but sometimes it is also a machine, okay, or another computer. Now let's talk about the abstract view of components of a computer systems, okay? So basically we have users, application programs, operating systems, and computer hardware. So we could say that computer is a hardware plus the operating system, plus apps, plus users. So OS serves as interface between the hardware and the apps and users. So OS provides services for apps and users. OS manages resources. So a government model, it doesn't produce anything. Okay. So debates about what is included in the operating system. So just the kernel or everything the vendor ships is that it consider the distinction between system applications and third party or user apps All right so basically the user interacts with the application program traversing through the operating systems and to the hardware no user can communicate directly with a computer hardware Okay, so it, it should pass us through application programs and operating systems. What operating systems do? So depends on the point of view. So users want convenience, ease of use in good performance, especially to those who are a gamer and those who are rendering videos on their computer. They don't care about resource utilization, especially if you have a lot or ample amount of resources to use so but shared computers such as mainframe or mini computer must keep all users happy operating system is a resource allocator and control program making efficient use of hardware and managing execution of user programs so users of dedicated systems such as the workstations have dedicated resources but frequently used shared resources are from the servers so mobile devices like smartphones and tablets are resource poor, optimized for usability and battery life. So mobile user interfaces such as touchscreen, voice recognitions, those are uh, under mobile devices or tablets. So some computers have little or no user interface such as the embedded computers in devices and automobiles. So it runs primarily without user intervention. Defining an operating system. So the term OS covers many roles because of myriad design and uses of OSS. So it might be present in toasters through ships, spacecrafts, okay, game machines, TVs, and industrial control system. So born when fixed, use computers for military became more general purpose and needed resource management and program control okay now let us define an operating system based on the perspective of an it people so no universally accepted definition for the operating system okay so everything a vendor ships when you order an operating system is a good approximation but varies wildly Okay, so the one program running at all times on a computer is what you call kernel. Kernel is part of the operating system. So everything else is either a system program or an application program. Okay, so system program ships with the operating system, but not part of the kernel. Application program all programs not associated with the operating systems. So one definition that I would give with the operating system is that my operating system is my resource allocator. 
when you say resource allocator, it manages and allocates resources. I would also define an operating system as the one who controls the program. Controlling program controls the execution of user programs and operations of I.O. devices. Some define uh, an operating system as a kernel, the one program that is running at all times, or else being an application programs. Okay, so today's OSS for general purpose and mobile computing also include middleware. This is a set of software or software frameworks that provide additional services or additional services to applications, developers, such as databases, multimedia, graphics, etc. Overview of a computer system structure. Computer system organization. So what are all the parts and how they fit together? Okay. So computer system operation. So one or more CPUs, device controllers connect to a common bus, providing access to shared memory. So concurrent execution of CPUs and devices competing for the memory cycles. So basically, all the components or peripherals or devices connected to a computer systems has what you call controllers. These controllers communicate with the CPU via the operating systems. Okay, so we provide device drivers for the controller. So if the user wants to communicate with the hardware, okay, it will be possible via this controller communicating with the operating systems and then with the hardware. Okay, so all devices and peripherals in a computer system has their own controllers. Just like on this diagram here, you've got this controller for the desks. You've got USB controller if you are using the USB mouse, keyboard, and printer and other devices. Okay, so your graphic card also has an adapter. Okay, and all of these are using a system bus or a common system bus to communicate and to move data from the devices going to the CPU. Computer system operation. So I.O. devices and the CPU can execute concurrently. When you say I.O., this pertains to input-output or any peripherals attached to your computer. So each device controller is in charge of a particular device type. So let's go back to the previous slide here. As what I mentioned earlier, each device here or each peripheral has their own device controller. Okay. Each device controller has a local buffer. When you say local buffer, that pertains to the local memory. Each device controller type has an operating system device driver to manage it. So every time you purchase a device, for instance, a printer, there should be a device driver associated with it. Okay. So any peripherals or any hardware that you want to attach to your computer should have their own device driver. Okay. So sometimes the operating systems provides a generic driver for the device. All right. Next, so CPU moves data from and to the main memory to or from the local buffers. And that traverses via this system bus here. The IO is from the device, the local buffer of a controller. And then device controller informs the CPU that it has finished its operation by causing an interrupt. So we will be dealing with interrupt on this video lecture. Okay. There are also what you call a bootstrap program. Okay. Under computer system operation, you've got the shared memory between CPU and IO cards, time slicing for the multi-process operation, interrupt handling. Okay. So clock, hardware, software, and implementation of system calls. Common functions of interrupt. So interrupt transfer controls to the interrupt service routine, generally through the interrupt vector, which contains the address of all the service routines. So interrupt architecture must save the address of the interrupted instruction. A trap or exception is a software-generated interrupt 
caused by either by an error or a user requests. So an operating system is an interrupt driven. When you say interrupt, every hardware or every IO devices in a computer system has their own interrupt numbers or interrupt address. Okay. So when a device needed to signal the CPU, for instance, a printer is running out of paper and then the printer will inform the user, Hey, I'm running out of paper. Okay. So it will issue an interrupt to the CPU. Okay. So causing a notification to the end users, that's an interrupt. Okay. So interrupt has the highest priority when it comes to the execution in the CPU. So any device that would cause interrupt will be entertained by the CPU. So whatever the CPU is doing or processing, if there would be a priority interrupt, then it will stop temporarily the execution of the program to accommodate the interrupt. So even users can cause an interrupt to the computer systems or to the operating systems. Okay. So you just have to press something like control alt or control break. Okay. So if you want to cause an interrupt on the execution of the application or programs. Interrupt timeline. Okay. So how do the CPU and the IO devices interact with each other? Okay. So basically your CPU is running the user programs. It also process IO interrupts. Okay. Now, if the IO device is idle or meaning there is no interrupt, okay, coming from any of the IO device that would cause the CPU to temporarily stop or halt the execution. So basically your CPU is kept busy on the user program execution. All right. So if there would be an interrupt coming from the device, so basically your CPU will accommodate the interrupt, address it. And then afterwards, it will resume with the execution of the user programs. All right. So every device in a computer system has what you call interrupt address or IO, or we, we call it the IRQ. Okay. Or interrupt request. Okay. How do operating system handled interrupt? So the operating system preserves the state of the CPU by storing the registers and the program counter. So we mentioned this on computer architecture or computer organization and architecture. So it determines which type of interrupt has occurred. It could be polling or the vectored interrupt system. All right. So the interrupt would be, it might be coming from the CPU initiating. Okay. So who has problems, something like that, doing some polling. Okay. The, the, the action of the interrupt is initiated by the CPU. Now, if the action is in, initiated by the IO devices, okay, so we call it a uh, vectored interrupt systems. Okay. So separate segments of code determine what action should be taken for each type of interrupt. Let's have an example here of an interrupt driven IO cycle or interrupt drive IO cycle. So first you've got the CPU running. Okay. And then device driver initiates an IO. So it will be transfer. Okay. On the IO controller. So initiates an IO afterwards input is ready. Output complete or error generates an interrupt signal. If there would be an interrupt, Okay, so that would be forwarded to the CPU. So CPU receiving interrupt transfer controls to the interrupt handler. Now the interrupt handler processes the data returns from interrupt. So afterwards, the CPU resumes processing of interrupted tasks. And then that's a cycle or that completes the cycle. IO structure. So two methods for handling IO. So after the IO starts, the control returns to the user program only upon IO completion. Okay. So the second one would be IO starts. 
control returns to the user program without waiting for the IO completion. Okay, so these two here is characterized by synchronous or asynchronous. So when you say synchronous, it will not proceed with the execution of the remaining code for the user programs. Okay, so without completing the interrupt. Okay, so the other one is what you call asynchronous. It will resume the operation of the CPU for the execution of user programs without waiting for the IO completion. Something like, okay, so there would be an interrupt. So let me process the interrupt. Okay, so if it is not yet done, I could go back to the requesting process for the users. So on the synchronous, you have to wait for the completion of the interrupt before you could resume the operation. So that's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Okay, so for synchronous, you have to wait for the completion of the I.O. prior to the resumption of the operation. For asynchronous, so without waiting for the I.O. completion, you could go back okay, immediately with the requesting process from the users. So after an I.O. starts, control returns to user programs only upon I.O. completion. So this is what you call synchronous here. Okay. So wait instruction idles the CPU until the next interrupt. So if there would be a loop or contention for the memory access, and then at most one IO request is outstanding at a time, no simultaneous IO processing. Okay. Now after the IO starts, control returns the user program without waiting for the IO completion. So that is our asynchronous here. Okay. So we have what you call system call request the OS to allow users to wait for the IO completion. And then you've got the device status table, which contains the entry for each IO device, indicating its type, address, and state. So OS indexes into IO device table to determine device status and to modify table entry to include the interrupt. Storage structure. So the storage structure of a computer systems basically are divided into the main memory and the secondary storage. Now the main memory is the only large storage media that the CPU can directly access. So characteristics are, it should be random access or it is random access, typically volatile. When you say volatile, you've got the temporary storage, okay? Your data is there unless there is a power. When the power is gone, your data is also gone. That is the volatile, okay? Now, typically, random access memory in the form of dynamic random access memory or DRAM. The second one is a secondary storage. So extension of the main memory that provides a large non-volatile storage capacity. When we say non-volatile, that pertains to permanent storage. Your hard disk is a non-volatile storage. So next would be the secondary storage. Secondary storage is the extension of the main memory as mentioned earlier. Okay, and it includes the magnetic disk. So magnetic disk or hard disk drive is a rigid metal or glass platters covered with magnetic recording material. So disk surface is logically divided into trucks and each track are divided into sector, okay? Now the disk controller determines the logical interaction between the device and the computer. So as mentioned earlier, we have here a controller because hard disk drive is one of the peripheral and it should have their own controller called disk controller, okay? So another storage is the NVM or non-volatile memory devices, which is faster than hard disk and also a non-volatile. So various technologies becoming more popular as capacity and performance increases while lowering the price. Okay, so let's have some notation review about the storage. Basically, the basic unit of computer storage is in a bit. Okay, so when you say bit, 
we are talking about values of 0 and 1 or in binary. Bit is actually binary digit. Okay? Now, a group of 8 bits is 1 byte. So, a byte is 8 bits. And on most computers, it is the smallest convenient chunk of storage. Okay? Another term aside from byte is word. Okay? So, which is given computer architecture's native unit of data. A word is made up of one or more bytes. Okay? So, you also have kilobyte. And one kilobyte is equals to 1024 bytes. Same thing with megabyte or MB. That's 1024 raised to 2 bytes. You also have the unit of data in gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, and so on. Storage hierarchy. So storage system organized into hierarchy. So this is based on the speed, cost, and volatility. So for volatility, we have covered earlier volatile and non-volatile. Volatile, temporary storage. Non-volatile pertains to permanent storage. We also have the term caching. Caching is copying the information into a faster storage system. Main memory can be viewed as a cache for secondary storage. Okay, so when we move our data from the secondary storage or from the hard disk going to a faster storage, we call that process as caching. Okay, so also we have mentioned about the controller or device controller. Now, this controller is being managed by a device driver. Okay, so device driver for each device controller to manage I.O. And that communicates directly with an operating system. So it provides a uniform interface between the controller and the kernel or the operating system itself. Storage device hierarchy. So this would be the hierarchy of the storage devices. And let's divide it into two. Okay. So memory, cache, and registers. These are classified to be under volatile storage or temporary storage. Now, non-volatile storage includes the non-volatile memory, hard disk drives, optical disks, and magnetic tapes. Okay. Now, registers, cache, and main memory are classified to be a primary storage. Non-volatile memory and hard disk drives are secondary storage. And optical disks and magnetic tapes are classified to be tertiary storage. Now, when we start from the bottom on magnetic tapes or tertiary storage, as we go upward, okay, so the access time is increasing. You've got faster access on the primary storage and then secondary storage down to the tertiary storage, the access time is decreasing. Now on the opposite, if we look at on the storage capacity, as we go higher on the hierarchy, okay, so the capacity or the storage capacity is limited, okay? So from magnetic tapes having the larger capacity going up to the main memory, which has a limited or smaller capacity, okay? So basically for the storage structure, we have the main memory or RAM. So program must be loaded into the RAM to run the program, okay? So instructions and data fetched into the RAM or from the RAM going to the registers. So RAM is volatile and medium sized and speed. Okay. So other electronic volatile memory is faster, smaller, and more expensive per bit. So that includes, of course, the registers and the CPU cache. Okay. So non volatile memory here, permanent storage, is slower, larger, and less expensive per bit. So that includes electronic disks, magnetic disks, what else? Optical disks and magnetic tapes. So how a modern computer works. Okay. So basically the modern computer are still based on the von Neumann architecture. Okay. So you've got the CPU and all the instructions are being loaded into the memory. 
So that is from the device. Okay, so from the I.O. devices or peripherals. So information or data will be fetched and moved into the memory. And the CPU directly communicates with the RAM. Okay, so there is a data movement between the CPU and the memory. So each instruction being executed by the CPU is from and to the memory. Okay, so the CPU initiates IO requests, okay, data and interruption, and it will be loaded into the memory. So basically, when we execute program, we fetched it from the hard disk, load it into the RAM, and then the CPU will get it from the RAM. Okay, so load it into the cache and then execute. All right. Now we have the next term, which is DMA or the direct memory access. So we've got DMA here. Okay, so from the device, your data is loaded into the faster access memory. That's DMA or direct memory access. So used for high speed IO device able to transmit information at close to memory speeds. So device controller transfers blocks of data from buffer storage directly to the main memory without the CPU intervention. So going back from the diagram here, okay? So if you will observe, the CPU is not part of the data movement, okay? So the CPU is not aware about the data movement from the device going to the memory, okay? So only one interrupt is generated per block rather than one or the one interrupt per byte. Operating system operations. So you've got a bootstrap program, simple code to initialize the system, and then load the kernel. Okay. So basically, when you boot up your computer system, so it will start with a bootstrap program. Okay. And then it will load the kernel. And then afterwards, it will start system daemons. System daemons are services provided outside of the kernel. Okay. And then you also have the kernel interrupt driven hardware and software. So hardware interrupt by one of the devices. Software interrupt, exception or trap. So something like software error. So division by zero is an error. That's an interrupt. Request for operating system service or system call. That is also a form of a software interrupt. Other processes. Problems includes infinite loop, processes modifying other or each other or the operating system. All of those are software interrupt. Okay. If the interrupt is caused by a program, we call it software interrupt. If the interrupt is caused by a hardware or an IO, we call it hardware interrupt. Multiprogramming or batch system. Okay. So what are the OS features needed for multi-programming? So first, there should be an IO routine supplied by the system. So there should also be memory management. The system must allocate the memory to several jobs. When you say job, this is also known as the process, okay, or the program in execution. So next would be CPU scheduling or also known as job scheduling. So the system must choose among several jobs ready to run. And then afterwards, allocation of devices. Okay. So in multi-programming, single users cannot always keep CPU and IO devices busy. So multi-programming organizes jobs, code and data. So CPU always has one to execute. So in CPU scheduling, Okay, so we have to keep the CPU as busy as possible. Okay, so a subset of the total jobs in the system is kept in the memory. Memory is one of the resource. And when you execute a program, we call it job. And job needs a resource like a memory. So one job selected and run via CPU scheduling or job scheduling, also known as process scheduling. So when the job has to wait, okay, for IO, maybe for example, IO switches to another job. 
Okay, so depending on the algorithm being used. So we will be talking about CPU scheduling on the next modules. Multitasking or the time sharing. So time sharing systems or interactive computing. So the CPU is multiplexed among several jobs that are kept in memory and on disk, the CPU is allocated to a job only if the job is in the memory. Okay, so a job swapped in and out of the memory to the disk. So online communication between the user and the system is provided. So when the operating system finishes the execution of the command or of one command, it seeks the next control statement from the user's keyboard. Okay, and then online system must be available for users to access data and code. Now, multitasking is a logical extension of batch systems. The CPU switches jobs so frequently that the users can interact with each job while it is running, creating an interactive computing. Okay, so response time should be less than one second. Each user has at least one program executing in the memory. We call it process. So again, process is equivalent to job, okay? or a program in execution. So if several jobs are ready to run at the same time, we have to impose CPU scheduling. And under CPU scheduling, we have different algorithms like first come first serve, short job first, preemptive and non-preemptive, priority preemptive and non-preemptive. You also have round robin, you could have the combinations of uh, different algorithms, multi-level queuing, and you also have the multi-level feedback, okay? Now, if processes don't fit in memory, then we are going to execute or impose swapping. Swapping moves them in and out to run. And virtual memory allows the execution of processes not completely in the memory. So we have here a memory layout for a multi-program system. Several jobs are kept in the main memory at the same time, and CPU is multiplexed among them. Dual mode operation. So sharing system resources requires operating system to ensure that an incorrect program cannot cause other programs to execute incorrectly. Okay, so provide hardware support to differentiate between at least two modes of operation. So you've got the user mode, okay? And you've got the monitor mode, also known as the kernel mode, okay? Or system mode. Now, when you say user mode, execution done on behalf of the user. When you say kernel mode, execution is done on behalf of the operating system, okay? So it has what you call mode bit provided by hardware. So it provides ability to distinguish when system is running user code or kernel code. When a user is running, okay, mode bit is user. When the kernel code is executing, the mode bit is kernel. Okay. So how do we guarantee that user does not explicitly set the mode bit into kernel? So system call changes mode to kernel, return from call resets it to the user mode. So some instructions designated as privileged, only executable in kernel mode. Now, how about the transition from user to kernel mode? Okay, so as mentioned earlier, there are two modes of operation in the operating system to make sure it works correctly. So these are the user mode, okay, and the kernel mode. Now, Let's talk about user mode or user processes. The system is in the user mode when the operating system is running a user application, such as handling a text editor. So the transition from user mode to kernel mode occurs when the application requests the help of the operating system or an interrupt or a system call occurs, like what we have here. So system call, uh, system call occurs then that would shift to 
kernel mode. Okay? So the mode bit is set to 1 in the user mode. It is changed from 1 to 0 when switching from user mode to the kernel mode. Now, let's talk about kernel mode. The system starts in kernel mode when it boots and after the operating system is loaded. It executes the application in user mode. There are some privileged instructions that can only be executed in kernel mode. These are interrupt instructions. Okay? Input, output, management, etc. So if the privileged instructions are executed in the user mode, it is illegal and a trap is generated. Alright? So the mode bit is set to zero in the kernel mode. Okay? And then it is changed from zero to one when switching from kernel mode to the user mode. Timer. So your operating system also uses timers. So timer to prevent infinite loop or process hugging resources. So timer is set to interrupt the computer after some time period. So keep a counter that is decremented by the physical clock. So operating system set the counter in privileged instruction. When counter zero generates an interrupt, set up before scheduling process to regain control or terminate program that exceeds the allotted time. Your operating system also is capable of doing management. Okay, so one of that is process management. So the operating system is responsible for the following activities in connection with process management. Okay, so a process is a program in execution. As defined earlier, this is similar to jobs. So this video presentation or this video lecture uses process jobs interchangeably and all of this pertains to a running program or a program in execution so it is a unit of work within the system program is passive entity process is an active entity okay so when the program is not running that's a passive when a program runs it becomes a process or it creates a process and that is known as the active entity okay so process needs resources to accomplish its tasks. So whenever you run an application, it needs a CPU time. It needs memory. It needs IO. It needs files. And it requires initialization of data. So process termination requires reclaim of any reusable resources. So basically, process management includes process creation and deletion. Okay? So process termination requires reclaim of any reusable resources. So process suspension and resumption is also part. Okay. So next would be a single threaded process has one program counter specifying location of the next instruction to execute. So processes executes instructions sequentially one at a time until completion. So multi-threaded processes has one program counter per thread. So typically, system has many processes, some user, some operating system running concurrently on one or more CPUs. Concurrency by multiplexing the CPUs among the processes threads. So in process management, there is what you call provision of mechanisms for process synchronization and process communication. Now, what are the activities on process management? The operating system is responsible for the following activities in connection with the process management. So creating and deleting both user and system processes, suspending and resuming processes, providing mechanism for process synchronization, providing mechanisms for process communication, and providing mechanisms for deadlock handling. Okay, so basically we can see the processes or the number of processes in our computer when we get into the task manager. 
Okay. So let me open the task manager. Here we go. Okay. So performance. Basically, I'm running 204 processes right now. Okay. There are 2,161 threads. All right. So CPU utilization, the speed is there. The memory utilization. Okay. The disk utilization, Wi-Fi, GPU, and so on. So these are being provided by the operating systems. Okay. So my virtualization is enabled and I am using, or this computer is using three caches. So L1, L2, and L3 cache. All right. So all of these activities okay, can be monitored via task manager. Okay. You can even see the applications running. Okay. You've got the background and the foreground processes here. Okay. So all of this are being performed by the operating system. Memory management. Memory is a large array of words or bytes. It's with its own address. So it is a repository of quickly accessible data shared by the CPU and IO devices. Okay, the main memory is volatile as we described earlier on. Okay, so it is a volatile storage device. It loses its content in case of system failure. So the operating system is responsible for the following activities in connection with the memory management. So first, keep track of which parts of the memory are currently being used and by whom. Okay, so going back to our task manager here. Okay, so we can see applications consuming the resources, the memory, the disk or the CPU and the network there. Okay. Next would be deciding which process or parts thereof and data to move into and out of the memory. Okay. So which means decide which process to load when the memory space becomes available. And last would be allocating and deallocating memory spaces as needed. Next would be file system management. So let's start with the definition of file. Okay. So file is a collection of related information defined by each creator. So commonly files represent programs, both source and object forms and data. The operating system is responsible for the following activities in connection with the file management. Okay. So one would be file creation and deletion. So creating and deleting files and directories. You've got directory creation and deletion also. Primitives to manipulate files and directories. Support of primitives for manipulating files and directories. Okay. So mapping files into secondary storage. And file backup on stable or non-volatile storage media. Okay. Now the operating system provides a uniform logical view of information storage. So abstract physical properties to logical unit. That's a file. Okay. Now each medium is controlled by a device, disk drives, tape drives, etc. So varying properties include speed, Okay, capacity, transfer rate, and the access method. Would it be sequential on some storage devices like tape or random access? Random memory, okay, or the mass storage management. So since the main memory or the primary storage is volatile and too small to accommodate all data and programs permanently. So the computer system must provide a secondary storage. Okay. That is to back up the main memory. Most modern computer systems uses disks as the principle of online storage medium for both programs and data. 
Now, the operating system is responsible for the following activities in connection with desk management. You've got the free space management, okay, mounting and unmounting, the storage allocation, disk scheduling or the CPU scheduling or process scheduling, partitioning and protection. So usually, disks used to store data and does not fit into main memory or data must be kept for a long period of time on the mass storage. So proper management is required, okay? And that is in central importance. So the utmost importance would be imposed on the mass storage management. So the entire speed of computer orientation hinges on disk subsystem and its algorithms. Caching. Important principle performed at many levels in computer, in hardware, operating system, and software level. So information in use copied from slower to faster storage temporarily. So caching use of high-speed memory to hold recently accessed data. So it requires a cache management policy. Okay. So faster storage or cache check first to determine if information is there. If it is there, information used directly from the cache. If not, data copied to cache and used there. Caching introduces another level in storage hierarchy. This requires data that is simultaneously stored in more than one level to be consistent. So cache smaller than the storage being cached. Cache management important design problem and cache size and replacement policy. Characteristics of various types of storage. So movement between levels of storage hierarchy can be explicit or implicit. Okay. So from the diagram that we have presented earlier, starting at the bottom, okay, so the capacity going upward, going to the register is decreasing. But the speed from the bottom or from the magnetic tape going to the register, you've got faster. Okay, faster access as we move upward. Okay, now typical size for register is less than 1 KB. Okay, and if you will observe for magnetic disk, it's less than 10 terabytes. The size increases or the capacity increases. Okay, now implementation technology for registers, custom memory with multiple ports, CMOS, CAS is on chip or off chip CMOS. Usually it is within the CPU. Main memory is in CMOS SRAM mounted on the motherboard via modules. The solid state uses the flash memory and the magnetic disk or the hard disk uses magnetic disk. Okay. So you also have other factors like access time, bandwidth, managed by, okay. So registers are managed by the compilers. Cache, hardware, main memory is being managed by the operating system, okay. So with the solid state device and the magnetic hard disk, okay. So backed up, you've got cache, main memory, disk, Okay, and then disk or tape. How about migration of data? Let's say data A from disk to register. Okay, so assuming that our program is stored in hard disk. So first it will be migrated to the main memory. Afterward, it will be moved to the CPU memory or cache and then to the hardware registers. So multitasking environment must be careful to use most recent value, no matter where it is stored in the storage hierarchy. So multiprocessor environment must provide cache coherency in hardware such that all CPUs have the most recent value in their cache. So distributed environment situation even more complex. Several copies of data can exist. Okay, and we will be covering various or different solutions. Okay, so as we progress with our course. 
I.O. subsystem. One purpose of the operating system is to hide peculiarities of hardware devices from the user. I.O. subsystem is responsible for memory management, okay? general device driver interface, and drivers for specific hardware devices. So on the memory management of I.O., including buffering, storing data temporarily while it is being transferred, that's buffering, caching, storing parts of data in faster storage for performance. You also have spooling, the overlapping of output of one job with input of the other jobs. Okay, so memory management includes buffering, caching, and spooling. Protection and security. So protection refers to a mechanism for controlling access by programs processes, or users to both system and user resources, okay? So the protection mechanism must distinguish between authorized and unauthorized usage, okay? So there should be user identities. User IDs or security IDs includes name and associated number, one per user, okay? So the ID then associate with all files, processes of that user to determine access control. So there is also group identifier or group ID allows set of users to be defined and controls managed, then also associated with each process file. Privilege escalation allows user to change the effective ID with more rights. Okay. So providing a means of enforcement, all right? So when you say security, defense of the system against internal or external attacks. So huge range, including denial of service, worms, viruses, identity theft, theft of service, okay? And these are part of the uh, computer security or network security. Virtualization. So allows operating system to run applications within other OSS, vast growing okay, industry. Sometimes we are using emulation software used when source CPU type different from the target type. Okay, so generally slowest method. When computer language not compiled to native code, we need an interpretation or interpreter. So virtualization OS natively compiled for CPU, running guest OSS also natively compiled. So consider a VMware running Windows XP guests. It's running application all on the native Windows XP host OS. So also it requires a virtual machine manager, which provides virtualization services. So usually we are creating virtual machines. Okay, so the virtual machine takes the layered approach to its logical conclusion. It treats hardware and the operating systems kernel as though they were all hardware. Okay, so a virtual machine provides an interface identical to underlying bare hardware. The operating system creates the illusion of multiple processes, each executing on its own processor with its own virtual or memory. Okay, so use cases involve laptops and desktops running multiple OSS for exploration or compatibility. So Apple laptop running Mac OS host Windows as guest, okay? Developing apps for multiple OSS without having multiple systems. So quality assurance testing applications without having multiple systems and executing and managing compute environments within data centers. So these are just some of the advantages of virtual machines, okay? So VMM can run natively in each case or in which case they are also the host. There is no general purpose host, okay? So VMware ESX and Citrix send server, okay? One of the disadvantage of virtualization is that if you have uh, minimal resources okay so that's the problem 
because all the resources on your computer are shared. Computing environments and virtualization. Okay, so in here, you have a single hardware kernel and then processes. Okay, so this is a typical setup of a computer system. Now, let it be here, there are some implementations of virtual machines. Okay, the hardware are shared among different virtual, ma uh, virtual machines. Each virtual machine has their own kernel and each virtual machine is running different processes. All of those running on top of a single hardware. Okay, so there is just a virtual machine manager which manages the hardware. Distributed systems. So a distributed system is a collection of processors that do not share memory or a clock. Each processor has its own local memory. Another term for distributed system is a network or a LAN, wide area network, metropolitan area network, or the personal area network. So all of this pertains to distributed system. The processor in the system are connected through a communication network. Okay, so communication takes place using a protocol like TCP IP. A distributed system provides user access to various system resources. Access to shared resources allows computation speed up, increased data availability, and enhanced reliability. Distribute the computation among several physical processors. You've got something like a loosely coupled system wherein each processor has its own local memory. Processor communicates with one another through various communication lines, such as the high speed buses or telephone lines. So, there are advantages and disadvantages of distributed systems. Advantages include resource sharing, uh, computation speed up, or load sharing, reliability, and communication. This basically requires a networking infrastructure. Okay, so something like local area networks, wide area networks, may either client server or peer-to-peer -peer systems. All right. Computer systems architecture. So different operating systems for different kinds of computer environments. So most systems use a single general purpose processor. Most systems have special purpose processor as well. Okay one main CPU which manages the computer and runs user apps. Other specialized processor, disk controllers, GPUs, etc. do not run user apps. Okay? Now for the multiprocessor systems, it increased throughput. Okay? Faster execution but not 100% linear speed up. Next would be the economy of scale, peripherals, disks, memory shared among processors, and increased reliability. You've got something like failure of CPU allows or slow system, don't crash it. Okay, redundant processing provides system of checks and balances. So graceful degradation or degradation of fault tolerance. So there are two types. Okay, so you've got the asymmetric multiprocessing wherein each processor is assigned specific task. Okay, and symmetric multiprocessing, each processor performs all tasks. Now I have here an example of symmetric multiprocessing architecture. Okay, so you've got processor 0 and processor 1 here sharing the main memory. Each CPU has their own register and cache, but the main memory are shared. How about on the dual core design? So multi-chip and multi-core. So systems containing all chips, chassis containing multiple separate systems. 
Okay, so something like we have one physical processor virtually divided or virtually having multiple cores. In this case, we've got dual core. Okay, CPU core zero has their own registers and has their own cache. And so with the core one, but they share an L2 cache okay, leading to the main memory. For the non-uniform memory access system, okay, so one core could switch, okay, from one CPU to the next, okay. So something like, okay, so I have here memory zero and I have memory one here. The CPU is accessing the memory, okay, in non-uniform fashion. All right. Clustered system. So independent systems with shared common storage and connected by a high speed LAN working together. Okay. So special considerations for access to shared storage are required. We have this uh, distributed lock management as our collaboration protocols. So a good example of this is the implementation of the storage area network. Okay, so it provides a high availability service which survives failures. So there are two types for clustered systems. You've got symmetric and asymmetric clustering. So asymmetric has one machine in hot standby mode. Well, symmetric has multiple nodes running applications monitoring each other. Okay, so some clusters are for high speed Performance computing or HPC applications must be written to use parallelization. Okay. Some have distributed lock manager or DLM, okay, the distributed lock management to avoid conflicting operations. So this is an example of cluster systems. We have these computers sharing a storage area and this storage area network here our network of hard disks okay so which are being shared by a computer on the given infrastructure next pc motherboard so consider the desktop pc motherboard with a processor socket shown below so you've got your processor socket you've got the memory slots there and then these are the buses so this board is a fully functioning computer once its slots are populated something like if you're going to install your ram here you've got for instance uh, the pci but then we already have our memory or the display interface here just plug in the keyboard okay so even the lowest cost general purpose cpu contains multiple cores some motherboard contain multiple processor sockets more advanced computers allow more than one system creating a NUMA system, okay? So basically, if you have nothing to install here, like you don't want to use your display adapter and you use this instead, then that would make it operational, okay? Computer system environments. So this includes traditional mobile client server, peer-to-peer, -peer. it should be E here, peer-to-peer, cloud computing, and real-time embedded. For traditional, well, when I say traditional, we are using the standalone general purpose machines. Your computer is not connected to the network, okay? But blurred as most systems interconnect with others, like the internet, okay? Now, portals provide web access to internal systems. Network computers, also known as thin clients, are like web terminals. Mobile computers interconnect via wireless networks and networking becoming ubiquitous. Even home systems use firewall to protect home computers from internet attacks. So these are the traditional setup. Now on mobile, we have handheld smartphones, tablets. Okay. So what is the functional difference between them and a traditional laptop? So it's more handy. Okay and you've got the freedom of mobility 
with a smaller size all right so extra feature more os features gps gyroscope okay allows new types of apps like augmented reality the use of the wireless cellular data networks for connectivity so leaders in mobile includes the apple and android client server client server computing so dumb terminals okay by smart pcs many systems now servers responding to requests generated by clients okay so client server you have the server you have to set up your server that will cater the requests of the clients so the computer server systems provides an interface to client to request services file server system provides interface for clients to store and retrieve files next would be peer-to-peer -peer. when you say peer-to-peer -peer, you directly connect your computer with another computer and so on okay so also known as p2p okay so p2p does not distinguish clients and servers so usually in a peer-to-peer -peer, you are on the same level so in this example here all of these computers are client so instead all nodes are considered peers many each act as client server or both so node must join p2p network okay so registers its service with central lookup service or on the network or broadcast requests for service and respond to requests for service via discovery protocol next is cloud computing so delivers computing storage even apps as a service across the network so logical extension of virtualization okay so that's cloud computing so this includes public private or hybrid clouds okay so public is available by the internet to anyone who's willing to pay private is run by company for company's use and hybrid cloud is a combination of public and private okay so also you have the software as a service one or more applications available by the internet so platform as a service software is stock ready for applications used via the internet and you've got the eas or infrastructure as a service servers or storage available over the internet you also have the latest which is the itas or itas it as a service now in cloud computing environments composed of traditional oss plus vmms or virtual machine managers plus cloud management tools internet connectivity requires security like firewalls okay load balancers spread traffic across multiple applications okay next would be the real-time embedded systems often used as a control device in a dedicated application such as controlling scientific experiments okay medical imaging systems industrial control systems and other some display systems okay so well-defined fixed time constraints real-time systems may be either hard or soft real-time okay so hard real-time secondary storage limited or absent data storage in short-term memory or read only memory or ROM conflicts with time sharing system not supported by general purpose operating systems okay so for the soft real time limited utility in industrial control of robotics useful in applications multimedia virtual reality requiring advanced operating system features all right so that's a real time systems how about free and open source operating systems so operating systems made available in free source code format rather than just a binary closed source and proprietary like windows okay so counter to copyright protection and digital rights management movement so started by the free software foundation which has copyleft gnu public license or gpl 
Okay? So, free software and open source software are two different ideas championed by different groups of people. Okay? Examples include the GNU Linux and BSD Unix, including Core Mac OS X and many more. So, you can use VMM like VMware Player, free on Windows, a virtual box, open source, and free on many platforms. Okay? You have... Um, Hyper-V, okay, so that is, or that goes along with the operating systems, Windows 8 and up. All right, so those are the free open source operating systems and the proprietary OS like Windows. Okay, so that's the end of this video lecture. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day.